acknowledging the um, the importance of this vital issue this month, Suicide Prevention Month um, is September. It's also actually National Recovery Month, which is um, especially meaningful because oftentimes they go uh, hand in hand. So much of this month is about um, sharing information about knowing the signs, the finding the words to say and reaching out for support. And, um, and we do and we can recover with support resources, community, and resilience. So um, with that, my name is Frida Kayajet. Um, it's an honor to be here today. I use pronouns she, her, and I'm a member of the San Mateo County um, Behavioral Health Commission. I am also the chair of its youth committee. And um, very notably, I am somebody in recovery myself. I uh, celebrated 11 years of abstinence from a very vicious 15-year uh, eating disorder that ranged from everything from anorexia, bulimia, compulsive overeating earlier this month, um, which also felt very befitting um, given the National Recovery Month. And, um, and again, thank you for proclaiming September uh, Suicide Prevention Month. Um, I just am curious by a raise of, of hands, I'm going to look at the, in the school room too. I'm just curious to see how many people have been personally impacted or know somebody who has been personally impacted, um, who couldn't imagine living, who attempted suicide or by who took their own lives. Yeah. And more and more, thank you so much for, um, for sharing that. And more and more we're experiencing, um, extended the extended effects of the pandemic on our communities with increased mental health challenges and trauma and burnout, fatigue, and deceased uh, addictive behaviors um, amongst um, people of all ages, young people, um, older people, and everyone in between. And so throughout the pandemic and still today, um, when I talk with my friends, when I talk with family members um, and colleagues, uh, people through the committee with my committee hat on who have children ranging from five to 15 and beyond um, or uh, or colleagues in their 50s upward, they're seeing that um, their, their children, people are feeling pressures from isolation as well as the rapid changes in life. And um, they they don't want to, they're, they're struggling with finding the will to live. And as a mother myself, um, I and somebody in recovery, I absolutely have had moments in my my darkest moments when I was at the bottom of the bottom of the bottom of my addiction, where I just wanted to be invisible. And so it shows up very differently for people. Um, uh, older members of society are feeling increased isolation when they need support the most. And so what we know to be true, as I mentioned, is that we can recover with support and hope and resilience. And so the theme for this year is thriving at every age. And there is a website I wanna plug, suicideispreventable.org. And in it, you will find um, very simple language and three clear steps of what to do and how we can prevent suicides because they are absolutely preventable. The first step is know the signs. So pain is not always obvious. When we do pay attention, we can notice changes in behavior. And this ranges from maybe somebody is becoming less engaged or they're giving away their possessions or talking about um, suicide. Finding the words, um, suicide is preventable, also lists what words to say, what not to say, importantly, how to hold space, ask questions, and also be equipped with specific resources. Because oftentimes when people are struggling, it is that brief moment in time where we can reach out and transition them into action. I mean, connecting them with vital resources that can, that can help them out. And then finally, the third step is reaching out. So know that you are not alone if you're struggling. Know that you're not alone if you're reaching out to somebody who you identify as struggling. There is a new um, crisis hotline that was rolled out just this July, 988, which is specifically for mental health crises. So people no longer are calling 911 and being triaged from law enforcement. This line 988 is specifically um, personed by um, mental health and behavioral health professionals. And already in this county, since its launch, we've seen an uptick in those calls um, in double digits by Star Vista, which is um, the uh, community partner that's fielding those calls at present. And then um, also you can text E as in emergency, M, M as in Mary, 
um, to 741741, which also will connect you with trained professionals. So again, thank you so much. I also encourage you to visit the county website, uh, which has a number of events, both online and virtual, additional resources um, to connect you with community resources and so much more. So again, thank you deeply for proclaiming September Suicide Prevention Month. It's an honor to be here. Thank you very much. Um, and Jeremy, I imagine we can get um, the, that list of resources in our newsletter this week, maybe. Uh, we'll try for this week if we can. Or, we'll or certainly do it next. Yeah. yeah. Frida, I'll reach out to you directly. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any um, council comments or questions? Thank you for speaking out and thank you for talking for the recovery community. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any public comment on this item? Okay, thank you, Frida, very much for coming. And uh, I have the proclamation here. I just signed it earlier, um, declaring that the town council of the town of Portola Valley hereby designates September 2022 as Suicide Prevention Month so, and calls upon everyone in our community to find their role in suicide prevention. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, um, we will move on then to item 4B. Um, a presentation from the Race and Equity Committee regarding land acknowledgments. Oh, and this um, has been uh, tabled and we will be bringing it back at our next council meeting. Um, not able to get the presentation for tonight. So um, that will be coming to our next council meeting. Um, if there is anybody here, a member of the public, who would like to speak to this item though, you have the opportunity to do so now if you'd like to raise your hand. Uh, you can also wait until it comes back if you prefer. Anything, Jeremy? Nope. No, nothing at this time. Okay, thanks. Um, that brings us then to item five, our consent agenda. The consent agenda is considered uh, with all the items as one vote generally, unless a council member wishes to pull something from the agenda. Um, the public has an opportunity to comment on each item on the agenda though. So if you would like to comment on any item on the consent agenda, um, please raise your hand now. Mr. Mayor, no hands are raised. Okay. Um, then would anybody from the council like to pull anything or if not, pull the minutes. The minutes, okay, we'll pull the minutes. Anything else? Is there a motion on items B through H? So moved. By John. Seconded, Marianne. Will you call the roll, please, Melissa? Councilmember Derwin? Aye. Councilmember Richards? Aye. Vice Mayor Wernicke? Aye. Mayor Hughes? Aye. Okay, minutes. Okay, we have minutes on page three. Um, is the notice of the council following choosing the following members of the subcommittee to um, help them to uh, deal with the new sheriff sheriff's um, contract mm -hmm. and it was me and Sarah. Um, I believe it was actually Craig and Sarah. Okay, that was Jeff and Sarah. I don't recall Jeff. without going back to the. I don't recall without going back to the video. Definitely. Yeah, it was Jeff, Jeff and Sarah. Sarah. I'm sorry. I'll I'll make that change. Okay, I didn't think it was me, but it could have been. <laughs> okay, Jeff and Sarah, sounds right. Um, Mr. Mayor, if if everyone in the chambers could pull their mic just a little bit closer, I think uh, John in particular, it was a little muffled. We, we heard you okay, but just uh, for... Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I noticed that last time while I was out in Zoom land, it can be quite difficult to hear. Okay, um, so with that, uh, one amendment to the minutes then. Is there a motion on the minutes? So moved. Moved by Marianne. Second. Seconded by John. Melissa. Council member Derwin. Aye. Council member Richards. Aye. Vice Mayor Wernicke. Aye. Mayor Hughes. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. Then we move on to our regular agenda. Item 6A, 
is uh, an approval for a letter of thanks to the housing element committee for their past and ongoing work on the town's housing element. Um, this was requested by uh, Vice Mayor Warnikoff and I think Jeff um, as recognition for all of the work that the housing element committee has done to date through I think 50 hours or so of public meetings as well as a lot of other work that they've put together um, to get our housing element committee or housing elements draft ready to send off to the state. Um, Sarah, was there anything you wanted to say about this item? Well, I think, you know, it's pretty much just restating what you already said. This is really, um, you know, recognizing um, the tremendous effort from this community of volunteers within our town um, and you know, just really acknowledging that as well as not just the amount of time, but when you really look at the recommendation that the town council took, particularly on the site's inventory, I'm pretty sure it was 94% of what they recommended is what actually went through. And so not only was it a, you know, a very long and thorough process, I think it was super thoughtful and, um, which was made possible by the extraordinary input by community members. So I think it was the two working together, you know, over these um, many months to get this product that was essentially, you know, like I said, 94% of it is what was ultimately recommended by the council. So um, it's really just acknowledgement of both the committee and the community members that participated in the process to get us to this product. I'm, I don't know that we really need to, unless you'd like, Craig, I could could read the letter or whatever you recommend. Uh, well, I think it's in the packet, so um, it, people can read it there. It's not super long, but it'll take, it'll take a little while to read through it. Um, so um, is there any other council questions on this item? No. Um, is there any public comment on this item? No hands raised. Okay, then uh, I will bring it back for council discussion or a motion. I continue to, um, perhaps it's boring them, but talk to my friends in other cities about this magnificent document that I feel so proud of because we didn't just try to check the boxes and kind of get out of our responsibility while still sort of following the law, we actually tried to solve the problem. And I don't know too many communities, particularly of our demographics, who have done that. So my thanks does go to the com committee and the community. Thank you, Marian. I'll just say, I agree that uh, the committee did a fabulous job and I think we're in a much better position than we would have been if, had it not gone through their their, their heads. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'd like to add my thanks. I think that it's been a real challenge um, and the work that the committee put in in order to uh, achieve something that, um, you know, as Marianne said, I think satisfies not just the letter of the law, but is really following the spirit of what the state has been asking us to do. Um, and also I think has a fair chance of actually being approved by the state and not expose us to the penalties that we would face for having no valid housing element. Um, so I think it's, it's been a great job for both the committee and the, the public at large who participated in the process. So um, I think it is a good idea to uh, um, issue this letter in, in recognition of that. Okay, is there a motion then? I'll move approval. My second. Seconded by Sarah. Call the roll, please. Council Member Derwin? Aye. Council Member Richards? Aye. Vice Mayor Wernickoff? Yes. Mayor Hughes? Aye. Motion carries. And uh, the letter is um, from each, all of the five of us. And so it will need to be circulated, I suppose, to get all of our signatures. So um, we'll figure out how to do that, Sarah, while you're. Um, a little bit far away to sign remotely, maybe um, we'll figure out. Okay. Um, that brings us to item 
6B, an ordinance uh, regarding the posting of places. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, uh, uh, yes. one member of the public raised their hands. I, I looked away for a moment, so I'm not sure when that popped up, uh, Rita Comas. Okay, all right. Uh, let's go to Rita then. I'm assuming it's probably comment on 6A. No, my comment is on 6B, so I'll, I'll let you continue. But thank you for okay. noticing my hand up. Okay, we will call you on 6B then when the time comes. Thank you, Rita. Um, okay, so item 6B. Melissa, are you presenting this one? Yes, I am. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, I brought this item forward because, uh, as the staff report stated, in 1975, the Town Council of the Town of Portola Valley adopted an ordinance um, listing three places throughout town to post um, town agendas and other town important documents. And those locations are the Portola Valley Town Hall, Village Square, and Portola Corners. To this day, staff is still posting in those three locations, but we are also now posting on the website, which was not available in 1975. And in looking at where we are posting and in such a small town, we felt that it is prudent to update the ordinance to have one posting location physical for a paper location, and that is uh, Portola Valley, the town center here, right outside of town hall, as well as our website. And we will continue to push agendas forward to the public um, as we do now by listing them in uh, the newsletters and um, the digest. And I did wanna point out one of the current posting locations that we are posting at, which is at Village Square. The bulletin board that we use there is in pretty bad disrepair. It is very old and staff is not sure of when exactly it was installed. It's not quite big enough to fit any of our agendas. And so we have to get creative and cut out the corners. And then we have to post over town papers on, outside of the bulletin board. And then the bulletin board itself on the inside, the cork is popping out. So every time we open it, we have to hold that up. It's, <laughs> yeah. And so uh, we just felt that it's time to bring this item forward um, for your review. Okay, thank you. Are there any council questions? Karen. Um, thanks, Melissa. Okay, you explained why you aren't going to post at Village Square anymore, and that really makes sense. Um, is Portola Corners, which I assume is like Triangle Park, the mm -hmm. Alpine in Portola, does that have similar issues with the bulletin boards? No, that bulletin board is uh, very large, and it fits, fits our paperwork just fine. Um, we just found that if we're posting at Town Center, it's not common to have multiple locations for an agency to post their agendas um, anymore. A lot of agencies are going to one location to post paper agendas. And then everything now is being promoted digitally to go to the website. And so to be more, to fall in line more with other agencies in our area, we thought that it's best that we do the same. Okay, thank you. Um, seeing no more council questions, we will go to public comment and Rita is up first. Hi, thank you for taking my comment on this issue. In the past couple of weeks, uh, several members of our community have lost electricity and our electricity, our grid is just not dependable unless you have a generator and, um, you know, removing these other locations and having people be dependent on then going to you know the town center, which sometimes you know like if there was on Thursdays, you you wouldn't be able to uh, get to the building, and uh, removing the locations where people are used to walking to see these things since 1972. Yes, other towns are doing things this way online. We do not have dependable um, you know Wi-Fi in our lovely town. We do not have dependable electricity in our town and it's you know it saddens me to say that and i don't know how many people are on this meeting from the public and uh but there's not many when we have 4500 people in this town and they're probably dependent and they're not going to hear about this especially when this is only one reading of this particular thing yeah this is this is a town and other towns are doing things a particular way but i 
uh, this perhaps needs to be tabled for a couple of years until we have dependable electricity, this 2022 September, and dependable Wi-Fi in this town. I, I don't think that this is the right time to, um, to make this change for our community. Um, other people may think differently, but I don't think we can afford with the lack of information we are receiving um, because we can't always depend on the information and meetings are canceled and would be hard for people that don't yeah. use the internet the way that it could be or that don't have Wi-Fi to know that a meeting is then canceled. And I just suggest that um, this gets tabled for a while longer in our beautiful town. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Are there any other hands raised? No other hands are raised at this time. Okay, I will bring it back to the council then for discussion. Hughes, I did just wanna make one point of yes. clarification. This is the first reading mm -hmm. of this ordinance and there will be a second reading to adopt the ordinance. If this passes tonight, there will be a second reading made on September 28th. So it will come before you Just, I just wanna make that clear. Right, that's the process with any ordinance. Right? Any ordinance, mm -hmm. yes. <clears throat> okay. Um, John. Yeah, uh, Melissa's question. This is a um, uh, recently adopted state uh, regulation. Is that correct? Yes. The, well, it's I, I don't I can't give you the exact date, but the Brown Act does say um, that <clears throat> if you post an agenda to the website and one physical location, you are in compliance. And so, by doing this, we would we would be in compliance. Any other council comments? No, I think that this makes a lot of sense. Um, I think the number of people who physically go and look at the agenda and um, read it on bulletin boards probably significantly dwarfed by the number who come to our website um, these days. Um, and it is still there, you know, physically at the town hall, which is a very accessible location. So, um, is there a motion then on this item? It would be to waive the first reading and introduce the ordinance, right? Yes, it would be. I'll make a motion that we waive first reading and uh, uh, introduce the ordinance amending the posting of places in, in, this, in the municipal code. Uh, okay, moved by John. I will second it. And I hope that if there are people who feel strongly about this, as does Rita, that they, we hear from them at the next meeting. Thank you, Marianne. So moved by John, seconded by Marianne. All the roll, please. Council Member Derwin? Aye. Council Member Richards? Aye. Vice Mayor Wernickoff? Aye. Mayor Hughes? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, then we'll be back at our next meeting. Um, let's see, that brings us then to item 6C. Uh, the ADU ambassador program to assist with community education and a survey regarding ADUs. Um, Sarah, I think this was your item, so take it away. Sure. Yeah, so, so this ADU ambassador um, concept um, came out of the process. Well, first of all, Laura, I want to acknowledge you and of course jump in to, to clarify if I... Uh, if you have anything that you, you think I've missed um, here because you do such a thorough job. Um, so anyhow, uh, the, the concept of the ADU ambassador um, came out of the process of the ad hoc housing element um, committee to date. There was kind of two things that were that have been um, a common theme. Well, there's several things, but two stand out that are related to this with respect to um, ADUs. We heard a lot of passion from many community members about ADUs and JADUs um, and kind of leaning into them more with as part of the housing element. So that's one thing. Another thing we heard a lot from community members was um, a request to kind of harness the, um, uh, commu the, the spirit of community volunteerism to support initiatives within the housing element and specifically with respect to 
um, understanding better our landscape currently of ADUs and what the ADUs and JADUs, when I say AD, ADUs, I kind of use assume it's, it's interchangeable. Um, so to kind of assess where we are currently and get a sense of what the, the demand is for building more um, in the, the short and medium term. And so the concept here is that we would identify uh, two ADU ambassadors who would help support um, a process, a, a survey process. Um, and so what I want to do is I will, uh, just so I don't miss anything, I do want to read the details of this in the discussion portion. So that's at the bottom of this agenda, um, this agenda item under discussion. And so specifically out of the housing element process, uh, there was interest in um, uh, five, five specific areas. One, increasing education and outreach around ADUs and JADUs. Two, verifying the town's list of existing, the town has a list, so this would be to verify that list of existing ADUs and JADUs in town, and then assuring that we track them separately. There was a lot of support specifically for tracking and identifying them and tracking them separately. Three, determining community interest in the construction of additional JADUs and ADUs and or the conversion of an existing space to an ADU or JADU. Four, gathering data on the current number of unpermitted ADUs and JADUs in town and any owner's interest in an amnesty program that would formalize those units. And then finally, number five, determine the number of properties interested in renting their ADU and JEDU at the below market rates, which are the published rates for San Mateo County low and very low income levels. And so um, what we want to do is run a survey that will get specifically at those five specific um, areas. And our hope is that we can identify two ADU ambassadors to help um, uh, do two things specifically with respect to that. One is to generate resident interest and support any education around this. Um, and two, to execute the survey. And so by that, we mean that the survey will be developed by um, the planning and, and uh, uh, building department to get at those specific questions. But then we're looking at these two volunteers to be, to kind of own, um, trying to get the highest response rate possible within town. So our goal right now is a minimum of 80% response rate. Um, and so this we Im imagine will require a variety of methods of outreach, whether it be online, um, door to door, standing out um, with the survey in front of Roberts, you know, um, any way that we can to try and get at every household. And so that's kind of the, the, the role of the ADU ambassador, those two specific things, generating interest, marketing this concept and being a point person for education. Um, Want to note also that the education will include, you know, these, these people would, these uh, volunteers would be um, trained by um, staff um, and have, um, educational materials provided by staff. Um, so one, again, doing the outreach and education and the marketing around it, and then executing the survey. Um, other kind of uh, two, two, two additional um, comments on that is that the, the, the role is not related to interpreting the housing element or replacing anything related to that. It really is around the survey and education, and it doesn't supersede or change the programs that are already in the draft housing element. So it assumes that housing element is as is. This is specifically to drive um, execution of the survey, education around the survey, so that we can get this information. We're estimating that uh, the time commitment would be approximately 10 to 15 hours a week um, between the end of October and early December. Um, and there is, I won't read through this, but in the, in the uh, agenda here, we have the application process, the application criteria, the applicant criteria, and a, time, a proposed timeline um, with the goal of having 
the survey results to dovetail um, with when uh, there's an upcoming planning commission meeting. So Laura, please fill in any blanks I may have missed. I think that's a great, great summary. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? There I am. Yeah, I had some, <clears throat> some questions about the five central points. So increase education. Um, and you said that the ambassadors would be the point people for education. Would they also alert people of what I call some of the little hidden lines that come when you uh, construct an ADU, for instance, Cal water, if you have to have fire sprinklers, and I'm still not clear on whether all ADUs need fire sprinklers, I did. Um, that can trigger a larger meter, which is a more expensive <coughs> water bill. And then septic tank, if you're on septic, once you uh, go beyond the maximum bedrooms for your property, you have to enlarge your septic tank. And again, both of these are out of the town's control. And then the third little mine was property taxes. You will see an increase in your property taxes, right, John? So I would, I just like to be sure that this sort of education gets in there too. Would you think that it would? Laura, you want to take that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, yes, we do expect to include those types of things. It would be at a fairly high level. Um, but we're going to produce educational documents that are going to be geared towards uh, homeowners, towards property owners, as opposed to towards architects, which is, you know, we have a tendency um, in our department to gear towards architects. So we're going to try to give some examples of some of the obstacles sometimes that people face, give a sense of permit fees, give a sense of timing so that people um, can feel more educated when they indicate whether they might be interested in constructing an ADU or not. Okay. Thanks. Number two, would the ambassadors be the ones who would work on verifying and tracking the existing ADUs? We have a list of existing ADUs in town that we think is quite complete, um, but there might be some that actually count as JADUs that we have counted as ADUs. We want to verify that list, verify some of the data that we have. And so um, this would be the the ambassadors would get the people to participate in the survey, and then staff would be comparing that against what we have in our list. And if the ambassadors had some additional time, you know, within some of those tasks, we certainly could work with them in, in doing that. But the point is really to verify what we have and add, add any few ADUs that may not be on our list right now. Great, thanks. And then number four, which is the one about gathering the data on the unpermitted ADUs and um, gauging interest in an amnesty program, which I presume would be in the survey. Will the surveys be anonymous? People don't have to put their names down? So the way we thought about, about this is it would have to be a, a two-tiered two, two um, tiered approach because yes, of course, if we wanted somebody to seek out amnesty, that portion would need to be anonymous. So we haven't, we don't have this all fleshed out yet, but the way um, we've discussed it with Laura is that there would be a survey that would get to pretty much everything other than um, amnesty. And then we would, which would obviously have to be property address specific. So that part would not be um, anonymous, but then we would also within that process promote if you happen to have one, here's a link to an anonymous survey. And so we would capture that separately. Great. That's that's really smart way to do it. And then the last one, five. Um, when And this is for Cara. I'm just checking back. Renting these units at below, make, below market rate, we're not talking about deed restricted, correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Below market rate, for instance, just off the top of my head, I believe is 1,700 for a one bedroom and 2,100 for a two bedroom. 
which is significantly less than anything, you know, we see currently of it, you know, usually in town, it's 3,500 to 5,500. Okay, any other questions? No? Okay, I'll go to public comment then. Are there any hands raised? Two hands raised. We have Karen Askey. Okay, Karen first. Hi, all. Uh, first of all, I'd, I'd like to thank Sarah and Laura for um, putting this proposal together. I think it's a fabulous idea. Uh, as you might know, I've, I'm a big proponent of ADUs and JADUs, and I, I think we really need to you know, buckle down on this. Um, one question I have is why only two ambassadors? And particularly when you said it's volunteering is 10 to 15 hours a week, because that's a lot of hours. I realize it's a short time frame that you're looking at. Um, is that realistic? And if we had more ambassadors and we had people going door to door, like I'm thinking two people going door to door in this town is, is a big task. But if we had more, um, could we get more responses, really better understand the entire town? So that's, that's really what I was thinking. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. And who's next? The next speaker is Karen. Other Karen. <laughs> Other Karen. Yeah. Hi, I guess Karen's all think alike in this in this um, situation. Um, I also think this is a great idea. Um, and I also have the exact same concern that Karen Askey had in that um, I just don't think that's enough people and enough time frame to get a good survey results. Um, two years ago, I walked the entire town, the beginning of the pandemic, counting woodshake roofs and eucalyptus trees. And that took me probably, uh, you know, I don't know, 15 hours a week, like this kind of the same down time frame. It took me about five or six weeks, but I wasn't talking to people. I was just looking and I can imagine some of these conversations being really in depth and um, trying to get an 80% survey result. Um, that's really ambitious. Um, for those of people who have done surveys, they know it's, you know, it's great if you get 10%, it's actually fabulous. So I would encourage um, a little bit more of a realistic there um, and adding more people or adding more time. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Any more hands? Next is Dana. And Dan is, there she is. I mean, hi, I also just think it's brilliant. I was so excited that, that this is coming before us. I would suggest that a member of the ASCC and Planning Commission are involved in the creation of the survey. Um, I think that they, they know a lot of the history of the buildings that have gone in that could be converted. Um, and as I've said along, having been on the ASCC for so long, we approved lots and lots of secondary structures that were not even meant to be ADUs, the pool houses, et cetera, et cetera, that were approved by the town. I and mean, the building inspector was involved. And, I, and I've said, there are a bunch of them with, that we put deed restrictions on. So that's why I was, curious about following the deed restriction list. But anyway, I, I just, I think it would be a good idea to have residents involved in the creation of the survey as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. And uh, now I can see the list. Judith Murphy had her hand up. Hi, thank you. Um, I think this is a great idea. I also think that you'd be better off having three rather than two uh, to spread it around a little bit. Um, I think in order to do a good job, these people are going to have to have answers. However, people, the people they talk to are going to want answers, substantive answers. And I spent a good deal of time today going through the town website, trying to see how many answers I could find. Um, and the town website has guidelines, but looks like they're the Palo Alto guidelines. It has the Palo Alto logo on it real big. Um, maybe that's because the state sets these guidelines and they're all exactly the same. But I, I wondered if in fact our rules about exactly what the kitchen has to be and exactly how many, how big the refrigerator has to be are our rules. 
Um, and the only other thing is that the ADU checklist that I found um, assumes a new build. It's very, it's extensive as it needs to be for a new build. And the town is swarming, as Dana says, with uh, pool houses, gyms, et cetera, that were built as accessory buildings uh, when they weren't allowed to be ADUs. And um, they don't need foundations. They've had their geologic work, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera that I would hope that the town would build, um, build out a checklist that's very simplified for those things who've been permitted, they were up to code at the time they were built maybe 10 years ago, and give us um, a list of exactly what they need because the ambassador is gonna be asked questions about things like this. And if they don't exist yet, then the ambassadors can't really do the job you're hoping they will do. So there's gotta be a lot of uh, more fleshing out, I think of the details of not the ambassador program, but the ADU program itself in our town um, in order to maximize our use of the ambassadors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judith. And I see no more hands raised. Um, so I can bring it back then to the council. Um, Sarah, I think there, there were, were a couple points raised by members of the public maybe I'd like to address. I think that well, they're, for, they're for one, something that's maybe beyond what this initial ADU ambassador program is. Which, yeah, so so firstly, just um, Laura, can you describe to, to the comments that were made about the materials, the current materials versus what the plan is for future educational materials for ambassadors to be using? Could you kind of describe your thinking there and what you have in the works? Yeah, I, I'd be happy to. Um, we have preliminary ideas about this, but we still need to flesh them out. The materials for this still have to be created. We would not be relying on the materials that we already have on the website. We certainly agree that the materials we have on the website would not be sufficient for this purpose. So we want to create some um, materials for that are resident focused. So using um, not too many terms of art, not too many um, acronyms, trying to describe things in simple language that people can understand to describe the process of, for example, building an ADU that's detached from the house or converting internal space into an ADU or JADU, thinking about the amount of time, um, resources, you know, what kinds of professionals you need to be able to do this type of work, what kind of fees you're talking about, um, even some numbers on construction costs or valuation that we have in our records so that people could have a sense, um, you know, kind of realistically, like maybe a couple of case studies that could go into the materials of some people that went through the process and what their experience was. So we're trying to think if I'm a, if I'm a homeowner and I'm talking to um, my neighbor about this, who's an ADU ambassador, what's the basic information that that person would need to be able to fill out the survey in a meaningful way. And so it's not gonna be extremely detailed, you know, the same level of detail that we would go into with an architect um, on exactly like what the steps are and what the checklists are. It would be more like if I just sat down to explain to someone, hey, you're thinking about building an ADU, what do I need to plan for? Um, so to the points made earlier, you have to think about your um, infrastructure capacity, your septic capacity. You have to think about um, physically, do you need engineering? Do you, what kind of professionals do you need? Do you need an architect? Do you need a designer? Do you need a civil engineer? What might you be in for? And I think a lot of people um, might be surprised how expensive it is to build a detached ADU. And I think they might be surprised how cost effective it can be to do an internal conversion of an existing building into an ADU or a JADU. So trying to bring some of those things to light that might not be common sense, even for people that have been following this um, and try to provide basic information for people that have not been following this at all. So I hope that's helpful in our thinking so far. Yeah, and I think the only thing that I would add to that, and maybe Laura, you, you'll be able to, to clarify it better than I, but our, the concept that we've been talking about for this role is really the, the ambassador is not a building and planning expert. And so their role is to really execute the survey. So try to get 
you know, the mission of this role is to get to 80% completion rate if we can in town. Um, that's their primary role. We want them to be educated with the basics of the information as Laura just described. But for somebody who's actually going to go through it and get into the details, are clearly going to be needing to speak with um, a staff member from for planning and building. So these people will kind of be that first level of information. But for you know the nitty gritty, for sure, those people would get deferred to town staff. We can't expect a volunteer to be able to to you know answer all those kinds of questions. So um, anyhow, I hope that gets to a little bit of what what Judy was thinking and asking about. This, uh, it sounds a lot, and in, in just discussing this with you previously, Sarah, it sounds like this is also partly modeled off what we did with, I think, Lori Duvall when we were setting up. Yeah, over exactly. Years ago, where it's it's really having, you know, some, some materials that are prepared by staff. And in that mm -hmm. case, it was the sheriff's office and um, town staff, and then having a, a resident ambassador to go out and kind of bring it to the public at large and have those conversations um, in a way that's it's a little harder for staff. It's exactly what it was modeled after. You're right. Yep. Thanks. Um, okay. And so I guess I hope, I guess the only, only thing, there was a lot of interest and feedback from the community uh, on this whole, in this whole area as it relates to the housing element. And so I, I really do hope that we get um, a lot of applications um, um, because I think it's something where people really can contribute in a meaningful way in town and hopefully it can be a fun role as well, so. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Any further stuff? Yeah, Mary Ann. And through the chair, Sarah, can you address the question? The question we heard from more than one um, member of the public about the number of two ambassadors versus three or four? Well, I guess um, certainly we, I, I guess I'll go back to, we started with two because, well, well, either way, I don't know that I'm personally set in stone about that. I, one thing I was thinking when I was hearing those comments was perhaps we have two that are identified as leads and we come up with what the execution plan is actually going to be. And if we need kind of more boots on the ground, maybe we identify a couple more at that time. I mean, I don't, I personally don't envision the majority of this being door to door. I envision the majority of it being people responding online um, and then filling in the gaps with the door to door. But I guess we won't know until we know. Um, I don't know what do what do the rest of you guys think about about the number? Well, one one thing I think that's important is to have some level of consistency, so that if you have a bunch of people going out, if it is door to door, however it is, that everybody is singing from the same hymn book. You know that that they've all got the same facts, the same information, the same things. So you don't get a skewed response where half of the town is answering one version of the survey and half the town's answering with a different fact base. Um, and then it's harder to, to really understand what it means. True. Um, so, you know, the larger the group, I think the, the harder it is to, to have that coordination. Um, it's not impossible and three isn't that much harder than two, <clears throat> four is probably not that much harder, but at some point it starts getting a little harder to maybe manage. Um, so I, I don't think two is necessarily a hard limit and I'd be happy to, you know, as you're doing the interviews, leave it up to the subcommittee to, figure out whether two is the right number, or maybe we set a cap and say, if it's more than four and you come back to the council or something, but. Um, no, I, I agree, Craig. I, I think that the line between getting way too involved in the, in the details and making it understandable at the really more, more high level level um, is going to be important, and, and I think if you can, the more you can do with written material, and I think that's probably the, the point of this uh, first meeting or two of this group that would be able to put to, put the material together that could be passed out. And then at that point, at that point, maybe you're right, Sarah. Maybe you need to add a couple of people to help pan things out, or something that they don't wouldn't necessarily need to be able to come up with answers off the tops of their head, um, like the uh, people who have a little more in-depth training would have. 
Yeah, and I think the one thing I do want to clarify is the survey will be, um, you know, we, the, the role of these people is to execute the survey, not create the surveys. So they'll be executing it and fielding questions and sharing materials based on documentation that Laura just described. Right. Um, and I think the other thing is this is this is essentially step one in you know what's coming with ADU. You know, our housing element. There are a lot more programs around ramping up ADUs, um, and so you know if this is successful, it may be a model for some of that work once we begin it when the housing element is actually in place. No, I think it's a great program. I think we move forward with it. So, so, so do you guys want to increase the number beyond two? Or I, I, I would say, you know, I would leave it up to the discretion of the subcommittee as an interview. I mean, we'll see how many applicants we get. I hope right, we exactly. But I think if, you know, as you guys interview, if you find, you know, four great people instead of two and you think that it would be manageable and, you know, that the people would work well together, then I wouldn't be opposed to increasing it up to four. But I'd, I'd leave it to the subcommittee to figure out whether it's two, three, or four. I agree. Yeah, that makes sense. Indeed. Okay. Does that sound good to you as a member of the subcommittee? Sure. <laughs> okay. Great follow through, Sarah. Something we don't always see from all of us. Okay. Um, is there a motion then? I guess we need to authorize the subcommittee to do this. I'm happy to make a motion to approve the ambassador, the ADU ambassador program. I'll second. Okay, moved by Marianne, seconded by John. Council Member Derwin? Aye. Council Member Richards? Aye. Vice Mayor Wernickoff? Aye. Mayor Hughes? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. The one thing we, we should have talked about before we fully moved off of that, just to make a comment, is getting the word out about the, you know, this is not, this is a, we only have nine attendees, which is a very low number relative to what we've seen in the last couple months on these council meetings. So we've, uh, in addition to, we'll have to post this, I guess, on PV forum. Um, obviously it's gonna go out through the normal town channels, but um, for those of you that are on the call, um, please help us spread the word. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I don't know if we have a housing element committee meeting or any other such meeting coming up. But, not, um, not soon enough. Yeah, exactly. I think all of us through our, as, our, as liaisons to our various committee meetings, just let every committee know about it. Actually, you know what, that's a good idea. I wonder, um, I wonder, I'm just riffing right now, if we could have, ask all committee chairs to share this over whatever their next upcoming meeting is. Um, you know, yeah, we, I, I, I know some of them only meet monthly, so it'll be too late, but, but even if they could share it by email or I don't know. Yeah, we'll, we'll figure out how to get the word out. Okay. Um, that then brings us to the end of our regular agenda and we are on to council liaison committee regional agency reports. Marianne, not a whole lot of them left for you for this. I only have, I only have two. Wow. And really. Winding down. Well, you know, I've been out in Detachville for a long time. Okay, I went to a Council of Cities dinner on August 26, and it was held at Sanchez Adobe Park in Pacifica. And I don't know if any of you have been to Sanchez Adobe Park, but it is definitely worth a visit. Have you been there, Melissa? Yeah. Um, it, the, the, Adobe building is the second oldest building in San Mateo County. It was the home of Francisco Sanchez, the mayor of San Francisco, and the owner of the entire Rancho San Pedro, which is, but what is even more interesting, it is the site of an uh, Ohlone village, the, of the Ramaytush Ohlone village of Puristac, not sure how to pronounce that, P-R-U-R-I-S-T-A-C, um, going back to the original, I think they're called people, like 3,000 years ago. Uh, they also have a little museum with artifacts that they have found there, which are fascinating. 
So there was, um, the first speaker was a man from the um, San Mateo County Historical Association. He was the president, Mitch Postel, but he had a special guest speaker, Jonathan Cordero, who is a native Californian of Ramai Tushaloni, Bay Miwok and Chumash descent. And he is descended from the Arame tribe that was located there near Pacifica. He's also the foundation and chair of the association of Ramai Tushaloni. And he was um, fascinating to listen to. So it was a very nice evening. And they had a really wonderful buffet of Mexican food where they would make you um, food on the grill to order and just a ton of other stuff. It was delicious. And then the only other report is that I, as were you two, um, was present at the day when the kids went back to school. Uh, I was over by Alpine and Portola Road with a lot of school district people and people from committees and donuts. My recommendation is next year, way more donuts, maybe a big sign that says donuts. And I'm not sure if you should move the location. It was tough to get kids right there. I'd be curious to know how your location did. Where, where were you? Were you on the, were on the uphill side? We were, we, no, we were more, we were on the Portola side. Oh, Triangle side. Yeah. But really the donuts were the big deal. When the kids saw donuts, they came. <laughs> Well, a lot of parents came back from the emergency preparedness meeting. Um, let's see, it's uh, <clears throat> some discussion about um, radio repeaters being upgraded, um, DMRS installation on top of a tank. I guess it's up in electronicals. Uh, and <clears throat> discussions of their participation coming up in the town picnic very soon. Um, recommended recommended uh, the EPC go over their over planning future activities to evaluate the priorities of the for the evacuation study going forward. Next steps. Um, there's a report from Selena Brown regarding the SMC alert move to the rave platform, which is still in the process. It's uh, at this point, they're planning to have the move by in November. Um, and uh, so the San Mateo County is leading the state dispatch center. They took 684 calls in four hours during the Edgewood fire. And which is part of the reason, part of the reason it was so successful that they got on it so quickly. Um, let's see. There's a discussion of different apps that people can use to find local incidents that are going on. There's one called Watch Duty, another called Pulse Point, and Smoke Point. They're all apps that you can download to your phone and get notifications. And um, there's a move on the committee to move forward with a, some sort of program. They haven't identified it completely yet to uh, raise the awareness of which zone haven zones people are in in town. Um, a lot of people don't, don't know, and it, uh, it's kind of an important thing to know once there is an event. Yeah. The uh, next one is the planning commission meeting. Uh, let's see. There's um, two main issues on the agenda. One's the uh, subdivision Final subdivision map for 40 Firethorn right there in the corner of Los Trancos and, and Alpine. Um, it's been sort of up on hold for a while and now it, that was approved. Um, Alpine use, Alpine Hills conditional use permit was uh, came back for an increase from 700 to 750 members. And the main topics of discussion were potential parking issues, and um, uh, truck noise. <clears throat> um, there's been a plan put together going forward for the um, for the Alpine Hills staff to do some informal uh, 
traffic counts and see if there really is a problem with parking and what it is in, on normal busy days, which is uh, information that hasn't been readily available uh, before. Let's see. Uh, there was some discussion about uh, <clears throat> recognizing senior members in the membership program in, of, of the club so that people who've been members a long time don't get priced out basically. And that was pretty much it. Um, there was a, was a discussion after at the end of the meeting regarding the types of minutes that are appropriate for the planning commission. Uh, some con concern that when the meeting is um, <laughs> does not have any actions that an action minutes don't really show you much of anything. Um, so that's that's an ongoing discussion. I think that uh, Laura has been bringing bring back some ideas on that. And that was it. Okay, thanks. Sarah, you're on mute. Sorry, I do not have any updates. Okay, um, I had two at the wildfire committee meeting on the 6th. Um, pre presentation by MidPen on the work that they're doing, fire mitigation work on their property and their properties in Portola Valley. Um, that was a nice update on everything that they're working on. Um, Fire Marshal was there and gave an update on his work on home hardening code update and the work that he's doing. Um, sounds like that's maybe a little bit delayed from what we thought the original schedule was going to be, but still making good progress there. Um, let's see. Uh, they're going to have a table at town picnic, which is this coming weekend. Okay. Uh, then I had BPTS on the 7th, um, and that was a lot of planning for Zots to Tots. Um, sounds like they have enough volunteers now. Um, the Sheriff's Department is going to be helping coordinate the volunteers for doing the street closure. Um, so we've got the usual rolling street closure for about 45 minutes or an hour or so while the race is run. Um, and Jeremy, do we have updated numbers of how many people have registered? It was well over 100 people had registered, and there are always a lot more that show up on the day, right? 160 something, I think you said. Yeah, the, well, the numbers I saw on Monday were 146. We're expecting those to jump up quite a bit more. Um, last year, we had approximately 200. Yep. Okay. Um, well, weather's shaping up to look like hopefully it won't be too bad. There's a little bit of rain in the coming days, but I think Saturday looks pretty good still. So good. Um, and let's see, they also uh, got a liaison with MidPen as MidPen is now working on the Hawthorne's property and figuring out whatever traffic issues may come up there. Um, and then, yes, I was also at the back to school day donut thing where John and I were at the one that was next to the Priory. Um, and caught a lot of Ormondale kids who were coming through back there. Um, and uh, the kids didn't seem to stop for the donuts, but the parents did. So the parents parents would take the kid to school, and on the way back, they stopped off and had a donut in the chat, which was good. Um, and uh, yeah, I thought the location there was pretty good. I mean, it's right on the path where all the kids are going. They're all they're on that side of the street, and they're going right by there. And there's a nice, you know, flat bit off the road that gave us plenty of space to have a table and set up. We didn't run out of donuts. Yeah, we didn't probably didn't have nearly as many people as you got out there trying. To. But yeah, a bigger sign that says donuts would probably maybe tempt more of the kids to stop because they see these grown ups standing there around this table and they're like, I don't know if I'll. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, pretty scary. Um, but it was it was it was a it was a good thing. I had a couple of good conversations with parents going back and forth, and especially about you know safe routes to school and. Mm -hmm. biking and walking to school and all that kind of stuff. So it was, it was good. Um, okay. So that, oh, is there any public comment on this agenda item on item seven? 
I see no hands raised. So we're gonna move on to item eight, town manager's report. Thank you very much. I have a bit of an extensive report, so my apologies. And this is in no particular order. Again, hope to see everybody at Zots to Tots this weekend. Um, the management team had a retreat in uh, mid-August. Um, it was actually a great opportunity for, um, I think in particular, Melissa to spend more time with a, a few members of the team and to talk about um, council priorities and other major issues for the year. Um, we are um, in an effort to continue to improve our um, project management. We are utilizing uh, the Asana tool to, um, to do so. We are beta testing it right now for um, the council priority um, uh, management of the different projects there that we'll be presenting to the council on October 26. Woodside Fire Protection District has a, um, a grant that they're pursuing um, with uh, the partners at CEPA, Committee Partners uh, Assistance for Wildfire. They hired a, a grant writer to assist the district in those efforts. The um, grant is a community wildfire defense grant and uh, Woodside Fire has been speaking to both the town of Woodside and town of Portola Valley on the various projects that could be included. Um, at this time, it, the Woods, um, excuse me, the Patrol Valley projects uh, look to be twofold. One is a is a funding for uh, defensible space program, um, similar to the one that's in Woodside, um, and the second is a variety of vegetation management work, primarily um, in uh, what I'd say Upper Alpine. Uh, Los Trancos and uh, PB Ranch areas as designed by uh, Fire Marshal Bullard. Um, so we're very optimistic um, about receiving the grant. Um, next, perhaps next month, but more likely on November 9th, um, I understand the Emergency Preparedness Committee will be making a presentation to the town council on their recommendations uh, based uh, on based off of the traffic capacity evacuation study. Um, at the end of that study, there were a number of mitigation um, measures to pursue. And I understand that the uh, subcommittee has worked on ranking those and we'll be making that presentation at that time for the council's consideration. Um, I took a um, an initial meeting with um, uh, the management team at the Priory uh, regarding, to, regarding evacuation issues. Um, so they're starting to have more in-depth conversations related to um, what an evacuation scenario would be like for their um, students and staff and uh, the folks who uh, live there. Um, I'm anticipating internal meetings at the Priory for a couple of weeks until they start meeting with the Department of Emergency Management and a larger group. Um, in At the October meeting of BPTS, I'm expecting to see uh, an item related to a tree removal um, on the northern intersection of Brookside and Portola Road. There's a large redwood tree that's on town-owned property that some residents have indicated they believe is a visibility hazard um, on Portola Road. Um, so um, given the nature of um, the sensitivity of these kinds of conversations, I've asked BPTS to weigh in to allow for public discussion if there's any uh, comment from members of the public. In early October, uh, committee members are signing up for a Brown Act training, um, so that is coming. Uh, I am very pleased to announce that the town um, made an offer and uh, Tom has, his name's Tom, uh, has accepted uh, becoming our new permit technician. It's a new position for the planning and building department. It'll be starting in early, mid-October. Um, in during the week of October 3rd, uh, the town will be uh, uh, promoting a new website feature um, soliciting comments on the sheriff's contract negotiations. Uh, this is a portal where residents can provide their thoughts, comments, and concerns about um, what uh, they'd like to see in a contract. Um, and as a reminder, on October 26th, the sheriff, um, uh, the Council will be having a conversation about that contract. I understand that uh, Sheriff uh, Elect Corpus will be attending. The uh, 1920 audit has been completed. Uh, we got it uh, just recently and staff is taking a look at it right now and we're hopeful in the next couple of weeks, um, either late September, early October, we'll have a meeting of the Finance Committee and then bring that to the Council. And uh, we've already started work on the FY 2021 audit. 
I was at the Sequoias on August 26 with my colleagues from Woodside Fire and the Sequoias management team to discuss uh, wildfire related issues um, germane to the Sequoias. Uh, very well attended. Um, I think there were 80 plus people in the audience and then they also show that on their closed circuit TV. Um, was a well received presentation. Um, really appreciate. Um, Bud, looks like you're listening tonight. Bud, thank you for helping put all that together. Really appreciate being invited. The uh, town um, has, as you know, uh, an art donation policy and recently um, a resident, um, actually someone who lives just across the street from town center in Woodside wanted to donate a, uh, a horse sculpture, a gift horse, if you will. Um, we put together uh, a committee per the policy to discuss uh, acceptance of that gift and we tentatively um, uh, will we'll be recommending, recommending that to the council. We have not uh, decided on a location yet and we thought the best approach would be to ask the residents where they thought they'd like that to be. Um, so once Howard's had an opportunity to look at some sites that are suitable, um, technically speaking, for that, uh, we will have a, a website portal and solicit um, thoughts from the residents on where they'd like to see the sculpture. It's, it's quite amazing. The hazard mitigation plan is now in its first year uh, maintenance um, period. That's uh, primarily where we provide updates to the state on um, progress on the mitigation um, efforts that are uh, located within that. Um, per the direction of the council early this year, I'm working very hard to alter the uh, scoring that was done by the consultant team as it relates to wildfire. Um, so I've had a couple different meetings with the um, county folks on that, and I am optimistic that will happen. We are going to be participating in the Great Shakeout um, earthquake simulation event, uh, utilizing our VOC tool in October. And uh, I wanted to end in that we're starting to hear um, from cities on their initial conversations um, uh, with the uh, Housing and Community Development Department at the state of California on their housing elements. Um, we've, we've had a, a publicly, um, Redwood City um, has, in a, they had a rejection of their housing element. Um, we're aware of a second city that had a conversation uh, in the last couple weeks with HCD that apparently did not go well. I'm going to be speaking to their city manager very soon to find out what happened there. Um, the um, It looks to be a pretty difficult process for a number of the cities, but we remain optimistic that the housing element, as, as we have it, will ultimately be approved. Even if there are minor requests from HCD, they officially call it a rejection, but that uh, that nomenclature isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, so that um, we would expect to have the first um, inkling from HCD next month. And I think that is my report tonight. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there any public comment on this item? I see Rita's hand is up. Go ahead, Rita. Thank you for taking my comment question. I'm eager to see the 2020 audit and, uh, and the 2021 audit and, uh, and see what the letter, what the auditor letter says about that um, compared to the last auditor letter for the last audit we had in 2019. Uh, but one of the things, you know, I mentioned earlier about the electricity going out and there seems to be messages from the residents that you know from their cell phones i guess on the forum but nothing from the town coordinating uh the message to people and you know perhaps it's hard because if people don't have electricity they don't usually have wi-fi but maybe they can get the message on their phones but who is is coordinating that information and then on the corner of westridge and alpine road since december 23rd there is that um bit of an eyesore, which, you know, I'm sure my phones sometimes work only because that is there, the trailer that's been there since uh, December 23rd. Uh, it's a very big eyesore and there's constant work there and cones and, and there's lots of activity, car activity on that corner all the time, uh, along with work with AT&T. Who is coordinating that and uh, how long will that, it's, it's been nine months 
that it's been up there. Um, is that the permanent location? Is that the permanent viewing? Uh, we seem to be so concerned on how things look, but really to turn to my home, I'm looking at that since, um, since December. But who is coordinating utility issues uh, in, in the town? Uh, when in January, my phones were down, my landlines were down for 40 days and there was really no one to contact except being on hold forever with AT&T and with these uh, power outages. Is there someone um, that we can contact that's coordinating those particular issues? Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Um, Do you comment on that, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, if you'd like to, it wasn't really an agendized item, but if you'd like to comment. Yeah. No, but I, I'm happy to take the opportunity. As we um, the staff put out previously in um, at least one um, newsletter, um, it may have been two, but at least one, um, the um, the staff is is speaking with AT and T on a regular basis to get updates on when the work will be completed there. That is not a permanent fix to the problem. Um, it actually looks uh, what we understand is that um, they're going to move that. Uh, vault equipment to another location. Um, when I reached, uh, Howard Young does that primarily. Um, and I reached out to my contact at pg e six to eight weeks ago. And at that point they indicated that um, they were hopeful um, this fall. Um, at that point they said about three months. Um, so we're getting close to that. Um, so they're due a, a contact for me in the next week or so to ask if they're still gonna meet that deadline um, to have that work completed and the truck removed. And we'll put that information in the future newsletter. I think you said PG&E there, but you meant- Oh, AT sorry, at and Yeah, thank you. Right. Thanks. Um, and as, as far as PG&E, when there are power outages, um, they generally know about them pretty quickly and they coordinate that activity. So if there are problems where PG&E is not doing what they say they're gonna do, then um, feel free to reach out to, to the town or the CPUC. Okay. Um, let's see, that brings us to digest. Um, one, one thing before we move on, um, Jeremy, I was wondering uh, with respect to your, um, manager's report, um, if I know you have been spending some time recently on communications issues, and I just was wondering if there was any high level information you'd want to update um, the group on just because we've talked about it in the mayor vice mayor meeting and stuff like that. Sure. Thank you for the opportunity to do so. So um, the staff, Melvin and I, uh, Melvin Gaines, the assistant town manager, and I have spent a um, considerable amount of time in the last um, few weeks, but even before that, uh, working with the um, team on um, the communication issues is reported to us. Um, we've had um, I would say a handful plus of um, resident concerns about um, not getting responses to um, some emails. Um, at this point, I'm, I don't see a systemic issue with um, the town responding. Um, one of the things that, that I have done in, in recent weeks, uh, including uh, reaffirming with uh, the staff, uh, our commitment to responsiveness uh, to the public. Um, so that's acknowledgement of emails um, and um, follow up as it relates to when, if, if something that takes longer than a few days, uh, getting back to them. Um, and having spoken to a number of individual staff members, both the management and um, line staff memo I, level, excuse me, I'm confident that as a as a rule of thumb practice that, that we have done that. There certainly have been notable exceptions. Um, and um, in those cases, I've asked the staff to, to make sure that they're reaching out to the people who who, who had not heard from us, and, and that's been happening. Um, so we're um, in the early stages of what I'm calling a communications audit to track um, um, all of the different communications that we put out and see if there's um, any issues related to any of those, any holes. Um, each department is different in kind of what they do. Um, you know, the planning and building department has some uh, unique uh, features related to their communication. I think particularly wrong along the 30 day, uh, com uh, 30 day period that, that they can look at um, plans. Um, I regret that there's been any, um, any co concern from any resident about this. Um, 
you know, I, I remind my team that, you know, we're human, we're going to make mistakes every so often. And as long as we're not seeing a systemic uh, failure as it relates to our communications, then, you know, let's just keep trying our best. And when we make a mistake, as it relates to any, any of these that, uh, that we reach out, I posted on the forum last week and um, having, I've talked to the mayor today and I'm going to give uh, at least a forum update, I think tomorrow or Monday, just on kind of where things are. Um, my initial solicitation request from the public is it related to, you know, if there's any concerns that any of them have, I got a couple, which was very helpful. Um, I'm hopeful for more if there are more. Um, but we've, you know, where I think that there have been um, some issues have been around particular times uh, in the organization when things were incredibly busy, I think particularly in the January, February timeframe and around transitional moments when, um, uh, you know, staff isn't here for an extended period of time or new staff and the like. Um, again, I, I have a handful of those. Um, I'm glad it doesn't seem to be a much bigger problem, but if it is, I'm looking forward to hearing from the public on on that and um, addressing it as, as quickly as we possibly can. Thank you. And I, I just, just to, to take the opportunity um, to share, you know, what, what I've shared with, with Jeremy and, and this was before kind of the flurry of, of emails in recent weeks, this goes back to a conversation we were having about a month ago, you know, in, in my mind, I look at communications in in three categories. Um, the first being outbound communications. And those are things like the newsletter um, and things that the town sends out. And I think there's been a lot of progress there. And um, I think the new newsletter format is great and we've got some great information going out. The second category is kind of reactive um, communications to inbound things, whether it be phone, um, in person, in email, what have you. And then the third category is planning and building. And I think of, you know, there's so much more complexity in planning and building and, and that's a different category for, for that reason. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's, I just wanted to kind of surface that that's a, a dialogue, you know, that, that I've been having with Jeremy. Um, and then in, in addition, it's to me, I just wanted to highlight that it's not just email, um, you know, it's phone and, um, town center. And I know particularly post COVID, we don't have much, as much traffic at town center, but I just wanted to share that, you know, from my perspective, it is a priority to get the entry back open, um, the way it was, the way it was designed. Um, you know, we still haven't opened that post COVID. Um, and also, um, one thing that, that hadn't occurred to me is that with hybrid work, we don't currently have call forwarding. Um, so when people are working from home, you know, they don't have call forwarding. Um, and so people need to be checking their voicemails and whatnot. And so, I voiced to these guys that I think it's a priority um, to get that. I think my understanding is VOIP is in the pipeline, um, but just wanted to share that for awareness with the group. So thanks. Thanks. Okay, that um, then brings us to digest. Anything from the digest? Nope. Is there any public comment on item? Nine. I see no hands raised. Okay, then that brings us to item 10, adjournment. Thank you very much for coming tonight, and we will see you next time. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Good night. Good night.